Okay, everyone, welcome. I'm so excited that you are here, and I am just overwhelmed and overjoyed with our guest speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Ed Indira Etwaru. She's an award-winning producer, director, scholar, and arts and culture executive. I'm going to read this whole thing because she read, she earned every single line. So bear with me and listen close. She has worked across the world to develop multi-platform venues and content that represents the diversity of the globe and explores the complex intersections between stories that matter and the topics of our time. She currently serves as the first ever director of the Steve Jobs Theater at Apple in California. Dr. Edwaru was a major force to contend for content innovation and inclusion in the public media field. The founding executive producer of The Green Space in New York City and founding executive producer of NPR Presents, the national live events pro platform to bring live on air and online content to audiences across the world. Of note, she, executive producer and the American broadcast premiere of the 75th anniversary of Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, starring Felicia Rashad, and the first ever radio recordings and video broadcasts of August Wilson's entire American cycle, century cycle. In partnership with the August Wilson Estate and artistic directors Ruben Santiago Hudson and Stephen McKinley Henderson, she led the, the she also led the Billy Holiday Theater in Brooklyn through radical growth as the executive artistic director, more than doubling the audience, increasing revenue by 212% and producing groundbreaking content. Dr. Edwaru spearheaded the launch of the first ever national 10 million strategy plan for thrivability uh, for black theater institutions, the Black Seed, in partnership with Gary Anderson, Dr. Monica Ndownu, and Shea Wafer. Indira's work at BAM developed educational and humanities content that leveraged Bam, BAM's main stage work. Dr. Enwaru has been a professor in graduate studies at Temple University and NYU, teaching leading performing arts institutions in the 21st century. She has received awards and honors for her work, including 40 Under 40 for National Leaders by the Network Journal, the Black Theater Network's Larry Leon Hamlin Legacy Award, as well as Larry Leon Hamlin's Producer Award for the National Black Theater Festival. She has launched and published extensively on the performance arts, race, womanhood, and equity, and has served as a Fulbright Scholar where she lived and worked with refugee Somali women in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Indira is a mother of Zen Zele, a director and a writer and accomplished young woman in her own right. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the incomparable, wonderful, caring, compassionate Dr. Indira Etwaru. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm honored to be here with you at the 74th Southeastern Theater Conference, and congratulations to the incredible leadership of SETC, more than seven decades of service to the field. And thank you for welcoming me so beautifully into a space to speak with fellow brothers and sisters in the American theater. I am thrilled to see all of you today. 
I am not great at remembering names, but I've always said I'm great at remembering faces, so I love that we don't have masks, right? So I can actually see your faces. And, you know, COVID hit, and it came down to remembering eyes and eyebrows and trying to figure out how tall or short someone was in a Zoom box. But I don't know about you. Whenever I get into a room and there are people there, I just feel like celebrating. So I am so happy to be in a space with all of you amazing people today. It's really quite wonderful. The etymology of the word theater is to see. If we dig a bit further, the etymology of the word see, it is to be or to become. And so as the American theater stands at a precipice, shaken from the ease of normality, thrust into a separate peace, a separateness that allowed for reflection, new ways of seeing the world, ourselves, each other, as a global pandemic impacted every human being on the planet. And while the world was on pause, the murder of a black man happened in the streets of Minneapolis, Minnesota, by the very system that was meant to protect him. The oath of law enforcement is, on my honor, I will never betray my integrity, my character, or the public trust. I will always have the courage to hold myself and others accountable for our actions. I will always maintain the highest ethical standards and uphold the values of my community and the agency I serve. A knee on the neck for over nine minutes that took George Floyd's life. And so here we are. Again, convened, recovered, conferencing, and we are faced with an opportunity to see the world anew, or perhaps to be and to become a new world. Each day I say a silent prayer that we don't lose the lessons. And so my query today to those of us who are part of this great storytelling convention, the American Theater, housed within the great democratic experiment that is constantly evolving and devolving as time moves us forward. What do we need to see and who do we need to be or become as the American theater in all of its parts and purposes in order to build a world, as Audre Lorde stated, in which all people can flourish? I give you my story humble as it may be, it is today's offering. It is fraught with lessons learned, lessons that may be mine, but I believe can be ours. It is the story of a little black girl who was born to a time of fire. Born to a time of fire, these are the words written by the 20th century Pulitzer Prize winning August Wilson, words spoken by his character Boy Willie in The Piano Lesson. I was born to a time of fire, born in Southeast Washington, D.C., a black and poor community. Nicholas Van Hoffman tells us that in Washington, D.C., in the 70s, almost a decade after Martin Luther King Jr.'s murder and the burning and looting, nothing had been repaired. The murder rate had ticked upward. As for race relations, there were none. It was an era without definition, unquote. My family and I were center stage of the racial unrest of the 1970s, a type of, a time of storefronts, burning, protest, and a people, my people, pushing back against the systematic racism that has plagued this country from 1619, when a narrative of freedom commenced as captive Africans jumped overboard to escape the cruel novelty of bondage, as the white lion, the first of many vessels, roared to the shores of Jamestown Settlement, miles from where I grew up in Newport News, Virginia. This narrative continued with every runaway slave, every enslaved child who secretly learned to read and write by the dim light of a candle and every passenger on an underground railroad. This narrative of freedom strained under a proclamation that emerged out of one of the bloodiest battles on American soil some 150 years ago, and it grew faint 
as the laws of Jim Crow produced a strange fruit that filled the air with an aroma not soon to be forgotten. This narrative sparked a renaissance from Harlem, birthing the blues and art form reinvented time and time again as a visceral resistance to terror in one's own country. This narrative marched on Washington even as warriors of justice would never see the narrative of history rewritten. This narrative of freedom has many authors. It is a living document, and it has been edited, amended, and revised time and time again. It has been tested, challenged, downtrodden, and it has been shored up with countless whispered prayers and hallelujah shouts. This narrative sustained itself from the shores and soils of Africa and became a conduit, bringing the pulse, rhythm, and culture of different tribes to see, to be, and to become part of a new world. I was born to a time of fire, first-generation born American, to an immigrant father born and raised in Port Moran, Guyana, the first of six brothers to venture beyond the land of many waters in South America to Washington, D.C. to attend Howard University. The nation's capital is where he met my mother, an African-American pianist and steel drum player, at the time the only woman who played with Howard Steel Drum Band, born and raised in the nation's capital. I was born to a time of fire, and I was born to these two beautiful people who centered their children and who instilled in us values of honoring the humanity of all people regardless of race, nationality, gender, sexual orientation, or faith, a value of the arts and creative expression, a core of democratic ideals, and a value to believe in something bigger than ourselves, a supreme force in the world, a faith that could move mountains. I was born to a time of fire, and life was not easy for two people of color raising five children. My father often worked two or three jobs, and my mother was ill with cancer, a fact she hid from all of us until my freshman year in college. We were often on public assistance to make ends meet as a family, but there was music in our home, there was dancing, there was storytelling, and I had no idea that we lived in what would have been classified as poverty. When I was accepted into college, it was a moment of great pride for my parents. I remember my father on a call with the financial aid office of the college as my family prepared for the first time to hand their child over to an educational institution to live away from home, away from my brothers and sisters who I spent every day with since I was born to study there, and to spend four years with the promise of something better when I finished. I sat next to my father in the living room while he was on this phone call, and he kept repeating himself. I witnessed a growing frustration, but my father kept calm about it and slowly continued to repeat himself. Finally, as he sat down in the chair, the air seemed to leave his body And he went from these squared off shoulders to these rounded shoulders that slumped forward. And he handed me the phone. I took it and I said, hello, this is Indira Atwaro. A high, thin voice responded, thank God. I couldn't understand the word he was saying. My father, who shared the hybrid of a charming Guyanese and Southern accent, looked at me with eyes that pleaded for me to not get angry, which was my normal response to any injustice or ignorance at that age in my life. Had it not been for my father's eyes, eyes that had a deeper understanding and tolerance that our country, our world, that woman, were still evolving in their humanity. humanity. So I got through that call with a semblance of civility, my financial aid and order, and thus began my formal post-secondary education. The lesson. Change often requires civility and grace. A remembrance that the moral arc of the universe is long, longer than many of us would like, 
and our earlier years, but it always bends towards justice, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us. My mom and dad always had enough space for one more person, enough inner, inner understanding to tolerate the oppression and ignorance of a growing America, and enough love to let me find myself in what often feels like a lost world. They are no longer here, but their lessons remain. I was born to a time of fire, a time of desegregation, a time of busing children beyond the boundaries of their own neighborhoods. I was part of the great American experiment of racial integration, desegregation busing that transported me and my brothers and sisters in the outside of our neighbors and neighborhoods and to uptown schools as a means of ending racial injustice and inequity. But we woke several hour early, hours earlier than our white counterparts, stood on dark, often dangerous street corners, waiting for the daylight and waiting for a yellow school bus to come and to usher us into a more just world. My mom caught several city buses to get to school activities or PTA meetings, sometimes arriving a few minutes late, only to be met by administrators and teachers who were less than hospitable, often scolding. I oscillated between feelings of embarrassment and rage that my mom was being treated this way, feelings that a seven or eight-year-old does not quite know how to articulate. It was clear that although we were registered to attend this newly diverse school that included us, we did not belong. The lesson? It is critical to remember for those of us who are in positions of change that diversity brings diverse voices into the theater ecosystem. Inclusion gives them a voice, but belonging ensures that those voices are heard. I was born to a time of fire, a time of a little black girl sitting in a talented and gifted class of all white children and white teachers. Surely I wasn't the only child that was young, gifted, and black. A little black girl who ran faster than anyone else in the third grade, even the boys. And when I ran, I felt free as the wind until one day the PE teacher told me to take a step back from the starting line. She blew her whistle, we, we ran, and I won. She had me take another step back. She blew her whistle, we ran, and I won. She started to have me take three to four steps back. She'd blow her whistle, I ran, and I started to lose. Doubt began to creep in that perhaps I was not as fast as I thought I was. Certainly not as free. My third grade teacher witnessed this. She walked up to the PE teacher. She stood in her face and she said loudly, don't you ever do that again. You start in Dira at the same line as everyone else. Her name was Miss DeWitt and she had the same haircut as the ice skater Dorothy Hamill. I will <laughs> never forget her. I didn't have the language for it then. My mother often used the term angels, but this was an early example of allyship. A person who recognizes their own privilege and uses it to influence inclusion and call out or challenge behaviors perpetuating systematic oppression based on race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, and ability. I viscerally was learning what it means to not live in a world of privilege, of running a race where the system had me starting at a point behind everyone else. I was slowly and carefully being initiated into a chasm of systems, systems of who things were meant for and whom they were not. No child is born knowing that, but that is a lesson of learning that comes soon enough. Here is another question I hope we will ponder as a collective. What is our role as theater practitioners, educators, artists, to disrupt the centuries-old lesson plan and to teach new lessons? 
It was the first day of middle school for me, and we were placed in a line for day one of choosing our elective. Mine was band. I would like to play the violin, please, I said. I had dreamt about it all night. I couldn't wait for this day. I'm sorry, we are out of violins. Do you like the clarinet? No. Um, the trumpet? No. How about the flute? Okay, yes, I would like that. I was handed an old, dull, and dented flute on day one of sixth grade because they ran out of violins. And I love that old nickel flute, an Armstrong flute. As a middle child of five, it was all mine. Not something to share or split up into five equal pieces, but mine. And I said that often in my home. This is mine. Growing up listening to my mother play the piano, a woman who memorized Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue in high school, music came easily to all of us. I went on to sit first chair for middle school through high school through college where I earned the prestigious Hall Music Scholarship to attend college, a scholarship that was decided based on a blind audition from a submitted cassette tape. And I know I'm dating myself by saying I submitted a cassette tape for this audition meaning they never saw me. They made a decision on solely hearing my performance. The lesson I took from this was in how invisibility often oscillates between being an asset and a detriment. I am again considering this notion of what it means to see. As I entered graduate school, I studied with women and men who changed the trajectory of my life during these years. Sonia Sanchez, Carrie Amu Welsh, Ernie McClintock, and I want to acknowledge Dr. Ibi Cheesmar, who just published a book on my mentor, Ernie McClintock. Ibi, thank you so much. People who were extraordinary pioneers in their fields and who were waiting to pass the baton of revolution on to a next generation. These were the artists who helped shape an entire generation of black artists and black-led institutions. They, too, were born to a time of fire. Even as I studied with some of the leading experts in the field at some of the leading institutions, my entire outlook on life, the core of my being was completely shaken, and I was changed by, by 12 women, 12 refugee Somali women, whom I had the privilege to live amongst for one year as a Fulbright Scholar. These women had fled from Mogadishu, Somali during the 1991 conflict. They survived a civil conflict, rape, children being killed by soldiers and lions, days, weeks, and months of walking to flee another country with only their babies on their backs and children in tow, and they became cultural conduits, bringing with them their songs, their dances, music, poetry, and history. They were the carriers of culture and living bodies of knowledge. When I first arrived, I ventured out on a Saturday in January of 2004. The sun blazed, dust rose, reaching my eyes, and it caused me to squint as small puddles of sweat began to form beneath my hijab which I was given as a gift by one of the women when I arrived. Fastened to my back in an oversized scarf, my infant daughter ducked her head into the nook of my arm to ward off the sun, peeking out every so often to satisfy her curious gaze. We took in the dirt roads, packed with people negotiating over prices in Amharic, Oramifo, Somali, Arabic, and several other languages. Chickens scampered from the frenzied footsteps of mules, goats, and sheep. Women stood in, with arms akimbo in these vibrant colors and patterns. It was like a patchwork quilt through squinted eyes. And children sang in high-pitched falsetto tones for any spare change, while vendors took up every imaginable space cramped together to sell their wares. I was in the heart of Ethiopia's Mercado in Addis Ababa for the first time, overwhelmed yet grateful that Kadan, an urban refugee Somali woman whom I met upon my arrival, was with me. Somehow, even with the language barrier, barrier between us, 
We quickly became friends. Hustling to keep up with her easy stride that was like swirling water in a sea of people, my daughter's backside created an indent in my left hip. We weaved in and out of narrow, shifting mazes of people, and I tried my best not to show my anxiousness, my foreignness, lack of orientation, and on this very, very hot day with dust rising everywhere, my incredible thirst. Frantically trying to balance my bag, my hijab, and my daughter. Padan, in one seamless motion, tightened her red scarf around her face, placed my bag across her shoulder, took my hand in hers, and I swear, that moment was like a cool drink of water. The lesson for me is how learning can come from anyone and anywhere if we remain open, curious to the new. When we are in unknown spaces, take the hand of the new and see where it can take us as the American theater. When I came back to the U.S., I returned a drastically different human being. This was the professional beginning of my journey to explore and create meaning around the complex intersections between community, the arts, and the challenges of our time. Thus began my interest in working in the nonprofit sector. As I stood at a crossroads to move into this new world with an extremely heightened sense of injustice and inequity, I did so without fully understanding the paradox, a tale of two cities that exist in the world of arts and culture, in the world of theater. Many studies have emerged in recent years elucidating inequities in the, worlds of art, in the world of arts and culture and the theater. Those of us who have led African, Latinx, Asian, Arab, and Native American focused arts and cultural institutions, these studies were painting a vivid picture that we knew was accurate all along. The realities of leading an institution that primarily serves underrepresented communities to financial sustainability is a bleak enterprise given the current funding realities for these institutions. A Helicon collaborative study, not just money, analyzed funding trends across the country in 2017 and found that out of 41,000 cultural groups, just 2% received 58% of all contributed income. That's income from private foundations, public sources, and individuals. Those that focus on Western European arts and serve upper income, predominantly white audiences, were that 2%. Many institutions across the nation hold the very history of communities and cultures that have been dis disenfranchised, and that is why we must protect against disinvestment. Having spent time working in mainstream, predominantly white-led nonprofit institutions, leading major initiatives before leading an institution of color, I have a foot in each world regarding my experiences and perspectives with regards to sustainability. There are many institutions led by and for historically marginalized people, including the Billie Holiday Theater that I had the honor to lead for seven years, who understand the tenuous place that many find themselves. Institutions that have been creating great art for decades and were forged in cultural movements of revolution and resistance in a nation that has not always upheld its promise of liberty and justice for all. Despite the arts' role as a contributor to thriving neighborhoods, there has been historically inadequate investments in arts in low to moderate income communities. Persistent disinvestment and marginalization have left, have left arts organizations of color fragile. 87% of the African American theaters founded in the 1960s and beyond went out of business by the mid-1990s. 87%. Yet these organizations were essential to providing access to arts education for low-income and marginalized communities and children, promoting accurate cultural representation, and preserving the unique cultural heritage of those spaces. If we were to frame these realities using bed -Stuy, 
within the conversation of reparations, which is now a national conversation, it might look something like this. In 2015, a study was done by the Brooklyn Community Foundation. New York City and state arts funding was at a medium of $6.25 per resident, with a median average of city and state funding. So that's $6.25 per resident median for New York City and state arts. For Bed-Stuy, it was $2.44. So over 50 years, that is a $3.82 difference in investments. Now, the community of Bed-Stuy has roughly been about 154,000 people, and it is the largest community of African Americans in the nation. Over, over its, its existence, its existence of almost 50 years, that results in close to $30 million of disinvestment than other parts of the city and state. What does that journey look like towards true arts equity? If nothing else, this new journey requires, in the words of the great Toni Morrison, seeing in the new pattern of an old idea, the revelation, and the word a revelatory ecosystem that places our communities at the very center and demands of us, the American theater, an answer to the question, what do our communities need to thrive? As institutions of color look to build and reimagine business models of sustainability that move us into the future, we know that those institutions cannot survive, let alone thrive, without a full ecosystem of deeply engaged donors, private funders, government funding, board members, artists, partnering cultural organizations, and community members profoundly and intentionally committed to that survival. And just a, ha a hand for our ASL interpreters. <laughs> I believe that we can ensure the fundamental right to art for all people, especially the most vulnerable in our society. The absence of art and thriving cultural institutions to stand on the front lines with all people and all communities is not just a side effect of poverty. Not having that, that's an integral part of what it means to be poor. I want to answer the question that I posed to you as the converging pandemics of COVID-19 and the protests that rang out across the world in response to the murder of George Floyd. What do we need to see? And who do we need to be and to become as theater in the 21st century to build a world in which all people can flourish? This moment that we have all survived perhaps the most consequential in modern history, deepen my belief and my resolve in the power of the arts and the artist. The Billy Holiday Theater Theater Home is mentioned to the largest community of African Americans in the country. The community of Bed-Stuy, Central Brooklyn, epitomize what I believe should be a path forward as theaters think about their reimagining. Time Out Magazine called Bed-Stuy in 2020 the incubator of the future. There on Fulton Street, we created New York State's first street-sized Black Lives Matter mural, particularly poignant in the detail of 20 large rectangles representing the year 2020 and a row of caskets with the names of victims of police brutality and racially motivated killings in this country from Emmett Teal to Martin Luther King Jr. to Eric Hawkins to Trayvon Martin to Breonna Taylor to George Floyd to the killings of two black trans women, Rhea Milton and Dominique Fells. The community resanctified the ground of the Lenape tribe who originally occupied that space. They consecrated it with creative expression on the mural, song, dance, prayers, vigils, flowers, sage, chanting, and over and over again, it became the sacred ground of storytelling, the sacred ground to see, to be, and to become. And so hundreds of artists and community members came together 
even as we needed to stand apart at least six feet. And we wielded the sword of creative expression, a sword that guards against those who would attempt to oppress any democratic ideal, and the words began to appear, made up of 16 letters, over 150 gallons of traffic paint, hundreds of paintbrushes and rollers, over a thousand collective hours of bent knees on the asphalt of bed the unforgiving hot asphalt of summer in New York City, for those of you who know summer in New York City. The names came to us in our search for remembering, and they came to us through community members who could not forget. The list grew and grew until we had over 160 names, names that were a drop in the bucket of blood that has been shed on American soil in the name of racial injustice and violence against black children, women, and men, our fellow Americans. This mural remains the most powerful artistic project that I have ever produced because it was truly of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it was forged in a radical love for a people, a community, a justice. I was born to a time of fire, and I, like my parents, like my mentors, my teachers, and like so many of you here in this room, we believe deeply in a radical love. MLK shared power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. The love that pulsates in our very DNA, a love for justice, for humanity, for freedom, our theaters, our educational institutions, our communities, our stories, and our narratives, their fundamental love stories of freedom to this planet, with the hopes that we find ourselves and that we find our wisest, most exquisite and beautiful selves as a human race and as the American theater. Thank you. Uh, so if you have a question, because um, Dr. Edwaru has got a very busy schedule, we're going to have you write it down. And so if you could, if you like, just raise your hand, write it down, and then we'll, we'll have, either have you read it or have him read it, okay? So just, just to set that out there. But I know you're wondering who this gentleman is here, and he is a very good dear friend of mine. I met Eric McMillan McCall about five or six years ago at a Black Theater Network meeting, and we have been exchanging creative ideas ever since. Uh, I want to introduce him, and I, I wanted to give him the honor of interviewing and doing a Q&A talk back with Dr. Edwaru. Project One Voice, he is the founder of, is a national nonprofit for performing arts service organization that advocates on the issues that affect African American theater. His mission, or the organization's mission, is to increase the organizational capacity of our member theaters to cultivate and celebrate the artistic talent and achievements of African Americans, as well as other people of color of the field to promote a larger public understanding of and appreciation for African American theater and playwrights. We achieve this, in his words, through national programming initiatives. He has an annual fundraising event where he brings all theaters from across the country for one day of a stage reading to perform an African-American work, a monumental project. And I know personally he is now also 
working on a museum initiative to catalog all the mu museums that showcase African American history and stories. I just want you to know I admire you and I love you dearly. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Erich McMillan McCall. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, all of you. I'm originally from Alabama. So, um, hey, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. So, um, I grew up knowing so much about the SETC conference. SET conference. Um, and this is my first time here, so I'm just so delighted to meet all of you. And I love Lexington. I literally just got off the plane and I'm buying some bourbon, okay? That's my, my thing. So um, let's just get, get started. Indira, it's so great to see you. So happy to yeah. see you. What, I mean, I was overwhelmed when I knew you'd be joining oh. me. I, <laughs> the last time I saw her, she had short hair. <laughs> oh, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, I got the, I just literally just got off the plane, so I got the tail end of, of your keynote. But I know that the focus of so much of what you, 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 you're trying to put forth is just reimagining how we see ourselves as theater makers. Um, can you speak to how you're making that, uh, putting that into effect at the Steve Jobs Theater? Yeah, well, the Steve Jobs Theater, um, it sits at the highest point of Apple Park, and in many ways, it is it sits there as aspiration. Um, we as a corporation believe in making the best products in the world, but that everything we do is rooted in values of diversity, inclusivity, accessibility, the environment, and sustainability, privacy, et cetera. So it is a corporation that walks the walk, that it talks. And so we get to, I get to with my team, um, really not just launch uh, events that are about products, but also to create original content that is about our values. And we've had an opportunity to bring artists in, um, bring thought leaders in, um, really to just tell those stories. It's been really quite exciting to um, Apple employs 165,000 uh, people globally, and so for us, that's an opportunity to use that audience and just keep us aligned and rooted in our values. Yeah, wow. Um, you talked about radical love. Um, you talked about um, how it is. it can be that the way that we navigate that better future that we're all hoping for. Um, what, are, what are you radically in love with? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm radically in love with things that don't exist in the world, but they exist in my heart, in my mind. Um, I, I do see, you know, as, as an institution builder, as someone who creates art, um, as an artist, I always say to my team, we have, you know, they, they joke me because I know nothing about sports, but I always use sports metaphors. And I think I use them correctly, or either they're polite. I'm not sure which. But I say to them, you know, we were just talking, for example, about a project we're working on now, and there were all these questions, and I just stopped everyone, and I said, don't take the shot unless you see the shot. If you don't see the ball going in the net, don't take the shot. And, you know, don't build the institution unless you see the institution. Don't build, you know, whatever it is, the artwork, unless you can see it. And there is that refinement as you're going through the process. But I think there's something really powerful about having a vision and a purpose and a North Star. Mm -hmm. And no matter what happens in the world, no matter what lack there may be or seem to be, um, if you just stay focused on that North Star, I found that everything sort of comes into alignment. Um, if you have five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten and growing North Stars, it's really hard to achieve that. But if you can get a team really bought into a North Star and everyone stays focused on that, um, I think that's when really magical things happen and when the impossible becomes possible. Mm. That's great symbolism, you know, North Star. Um, let's see if the audience has any questions. Anyone? Oh, here, we, here we come. 
great. Thank you. That one? Great. Okay. Let me see if I can read this. Um, I know. I've got, I've got new bifocals, so um, they're progressive, so it may take me a minute. Okay. First of all, I wanted to say you are a modern-day James Baldwin in, um, um, uh, wait a minute, um, to the eloquence of your writing and your undying commitment to rad- radical empathy. Is that correct? Am I reading this properly? I don't know who, who wrote this, but tell me if I'm, if I'm mis- misquoting you. Um, the United States education system has moderated, moderated the same flawed Taylor, Taylorist flat. Uh, who wrote the question? Who wrote the question? Who wrote the question? Anyone? Yes, please. Thank you. It's much easier. Go right ahead. Great. Testing one, two. Yeah, you got the gist of it. Um, <laughs> no, basically, I just want to say, like, in your speech, it literally felt like rereading My Dungeon Shook for the first time. Like, that was very inspiring. Thank you for your commitment to all of that. Like, that was really moving. Um, in regards to the education thing, we have been using the same main Western-based high school principles since the 1890s, when Horace Mann and Taylorist Industrial... All that industry has kind of reshaped how we federally fund education. As someone who has had the opportunity to have a lot of more Eastern influence and um, empathetic work and more emotional-based work into how we approach equality and all of that, what would you suggest we do to implement more of that Eastern thought that promotes the things that fight against systematic issues like police brutality and all of that into our common core curriculums? Yeah, um, thank you for that question, and thank you so much. You know, I think it comes down to a cultural ethos. Um, We as a culture are ridden with cultural amnesia. Something happens, we we get stirred, we protest, And then we return to wherever we were before, whatever that was, right? Whatever that consciousness was. And I was just having a conversation with someone, and I've I've gone into institutions, and I always say, I didn't say in the beginning because I didn't know to say this, but I've learned to say, if you want someone to change the color on the walls or the curtains, I'm not your person. I'm going to tear down walls. I'm going to dig up foundations. We're going to start over. And I use that because I believe that's what needs to happen with the educational system. And I think not just Eastern influence, but there's some incredible, um, incredible methodologies and epistemological information that is rooted in African cultures, that's rooted in Native American cultures, it's rooted in all these various underrepresented voices, right? Even rooted in the way women are in the world. And just in case no one got the memo, this century is ours, okay? In case you did not get the memo. Yes, yes. Okay. (laughs) Um, But no, they're, they're just, they're underrepresented voices that have not been at the fore. Who, who could bring a different way of seeing the world, who could bring a different way of seeing educational systems, right? And so what I think is, I just wish we could find ways to literally relinquish and share space differently, which we have not done. And, and educational, the educational system is one system that's broken among so many, right? Um, and I think about this meme I saw, and someone sent it to me, and they, you know, were kind of like, you know, I know you know this. Raise your hand if you want change. And the whole crowd, the hands were going up, and people were screaming, yes, we want change. And then the leader says, raise your hand if you want to change. Mm. And you could hear. And so, not to in any way um, distill this incredible question down to one simple thing, but I do think that education is a business. 
right? It's a business. And it's so about profits and losses. It's about net yields. And sometimes our babies, the next generation of change makers and thought leaders get caught in a very broken business. The model may work economically, but we all know it's not working for our young people. It's not working for the next generation. But to your point, we should be looking to other influences, whether that's an Eastern influence or an African influence or a native or a, a, a gender influence or that we still have young people in schools where they don't feel safe who are from the LGBTQ plus community. So there are so many influences and points of view that have to make it into our educational system from policies down to supervision and superintendents who are leading school districts, to teachers who are in schools, to parents at home. It's, it's an ecosystem. And only a broken ecosystem can be fixed by an ecosystem. So um, I'm not offering you an answer. I'm only, in, in some ways, expanding on the thought that you've put forward. You know, Indira, I think I'm, I'm over here now. I'm, I'm giving you my Oprah moment. Oh. <laughs> Um, I, I think you, you posed a really great question that I'd love to pose to the audience. I mean, who here wants change? Right? I think we all, we're here because we're theater makers, and with what we do as theater makers, we, we are changing and moving the, the world forward. And I think asking the question, who actually, who wants to change, or is that... The, right, that's yeah, right. Who, I mean... Honestly and truly, change is very difficult for all of us, you know? I just turned 60, and um, I got hair shamed. <laughs> and I, I normally wore my hair, I was bald for a long time, and I started growing my hair out. And someone hair shamed me because I was letting my hair grow in its natural state. And they said, why are you wearing it that way? I said, well, this is the way my hair grows out of my head. This is the way God had intended it to grow. <laughs> why are you questioning that? So I, I think what, what I'm hearing, what you're saying, Indira, is, is we have to be the change that we want to see in this world. So if, if I could, may pose the question to all of you, how are you being the change that you want to see? I mean, if, do, any comments about how, you're, how are you moving the needle forward as theater practitioners? Any, any of you wanted to, to join the conversation and tell us how? There's a hand in the back and here and here. Yes. Hello. I don't understand. Um, your question uh, hit a big nerve with me because in you started talking about the pandemic and in 2020 it was a very hard year on a lot of a lot of us and for various different reasons and for me I was a new mom and my son turned one in the pandemic and I am from Savannah Georgia I'm an instructor at the Savannah Children's Theater and um, Oh man, uh, Ahmaud Arbery was his unfortunate passing that happened right in our backyard in Brunswick. And <laughs> execution, yes ma'am. And uh, it broke me in a million ways. He and my son shared the same birthday, though he and my son were not the same age. I got to look in my baby's eyes and say, happy birthday. I got to, he couldn't tell me then, but you know, we smashed a cake. That's what we did for his birthday. And I didn't, when his mom didn't get to say, hey, baby, happy birthday. Hey, be careful. I'll see you tomorrow. What do you want for dinner? What is your favorite meal? What do you want me to cook for you? All those things were taken away from her. But I was looking at my son in the eyes, and I thought, what am I going to do? So I wrote a musical on social injustice called Backpack of Power, and it actually performed yesterday here at SCTC. Um, in the <laughs> it's hard to put in words because there's so much hurt. It's so much hurt, and I thought, our children have to see something other than what's being played out on TV because it's hard. They were pulled away from, from their sense of normalcy. Their friends, their school, as were we as adults, we were pulled away from all of the things that we love too, but this cannot be the world we leave them. This cannot be what they grow up in. Time for change, yes. And did I want to change? Absolutely. I wrote a musical, and I'm incredibly, it was hard, because I had to do the work and do the research, and it was hard to hear people's stories. 
that was the hardest thing for me because not all of them I experienced. But change needed to happen, and I felt, I don't know, you, inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. And, and just a hand of applause. Thank you so much. And the black historian John Henry Clark he, he's quoted famously as saying, slavery ended, but it left false images of black people intact. So it isn't just about storytelling. It's about story untelling. Many communities, underrepresented communities, aren't just having to tell stories. They're having to make sure representation, when your little boy goes into the theater, and sees himself. That is a power that I can't even begin to describe because he's seeing that could be him. He's seeing that the whole world that's built around him could be his. So it's about shaping a consciousness and seeing himself as beautiful. Because I, I've worked in places when I worked for news organizations where I've gone into meetings large staff meetings and executive producer after executive producer puts up on the screen what their team is working on. And I remember one time I stood up and I said, I want to ask why the only time I saw a black face was in a headline that involved a crime. What does that mean for us as an organization? that the only face that I saw, so to show us as beautiful and smart and powerful and geniuses, and, and that is for every underrepresented group. You know, I don't know about you, but I was blown away by that kick-ass ASL interpreter for the Super Bowl halftime show. Yes. It changed the game, right? Yes. It literally did. She showed the disability community as beautiful and powerful and hip and happening. It was just such a powerful moment. And so every area of life when there are underrepresented voices, I'm excited to, to your question, what am I in love with? I'm in love with more of those stories, more of those moments. I want to see more and more of that. Yeah, yeah. This, look, go ahead. What? Here I come. Oprah's coming. <laughs> Oprah's coming. You got a car. You got a car. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Uh, just in, when you were asking how do you be that change, how do you make that change, I think it just takes being willing to admit what you don't know and reach out to people who maybe do, you know. Um, you know, I am a hearing straight white woman. Um, and my son is hard of hearing, and I teach theater, and have seen ways that he's struggled, and uh, I have friends who are deaf and hard of hearing, and so when I wanted to try to make my theater more accessible, I didn't know how to do it. So I just reached out and said, what can you tell me? What can you teach me? What we, we tried it and got the students involved, and we did a show with ASL Shadow Interpreting, and we... Um, you know, I've traveled places and just said, I don't know, what, what can you tell me? And um, it, it's a scary thing the first time when I said, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Um, but that's what we have to do. I, I think you're, you're so right. I mean, we, we all feel marginalized in some way. If, you know. So I, I think it's, it's viewing the world as a, as a marginalized person an under-resourced person. I love that word because um, for a long time we were using the term underprivileged, which I think um, was, was uh, in, a, in a lot of ways very derogatory. But I think when you think in terms of being um, um, historically marginalized or under-resourced, it, it gives you a lot more spe specificity. Um, so let me ask you all a question. Are there any times in your lives where you feel um, marginalized or under-resourced? Yes. Oh, hold on. Let me, let me get him right in the back. Uh, hello. Um, my name is Benjo Verge. I'm a sound and lighting designer. Um, I came here at SETC in hopes that I find somebody who is my color 
um, that is a sound and light designer, but it's hard because it's not many of us. Um, we talked about change. Uh, I think the first thing is to um, not calm down your blackness. I think that I've been in my own way sometimes because I'm unapologetically black, and sometimes when I'm not apologetically black, it rubs people the wrong way. Um, my second thing of change is that I'm currently getting my MFA right now. I'm about to graduate in May, um, which is it's my third degree. <laughs> and, and so, black people, please get your MFA. Um, and I say that because you're not wanted in this space anyway. So my goal is to make sure when I do get this MFA is I go teach black young adults and black children because I need to make sure that I push out other sound designers and other light designers. Um, and then my last, well, I got two more points real quick. Uh, one, uh, white people in here, please make people of color feel comfortable around you. I'm not saying that you have to be a white savior. However, um, we don't feel comfortable sometimes. Um, uh, the fourth thing is that uh, you have to be comfortable with understanding that uh, when you're by yourself, which a lot of times I'm the only minority in the room, um, that the other white people may not believe your concerns because they don't have to deal with that. Um, so you could say, well, this person, you know, said this racial slur or they treated you a certain way. They're not going to believe you, especially when that person said that to you and nobody's around. So you have to be comfortable with that. I think that I've only had one professor at my university that I felt like really treated me with decency. He just walked in a few seconds ago. Um, but if other white people would sit and talk to this man and like figure out what he does to make black people feel comfortable, his name is Matt Stratton. He's, he's over there. He's the uh, technical director at uh, the University of Alabama. But he made me feel comfortable to where I can go talk to him about things um, outside of, uh, of theater or even my you know, problems with the theater or whatever. But he asks tough questions that some white people are afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. Like, you guys don't ask, like, okay, where did you come from? Um, how is your living situation? What can I do as a privileged white man? What can I do to further help you? And I feel like he doesn't get enough credit uh, for what he does. And I feel like that other people need to hear him out. I feel like he should have been on a stage like this teaching other white people how to treat people correctly. Um, yeah, I so want to um, thank you so right. much. Thank you so much. And shout out to your teacher as well. Um, I want to I want to talk about um, and I'm borrowing this from Kenny Leon. If you're ever in the rehearsal room with him, Kenny starts his rehearsal by saying we're all from different spaces. We're all different ages, races, gender, sexual orientations. But intention does not trump interpretation. So if you say something and your intention was what you think your intention was, but my interpretation is something different, we're going to go with interpretation. And that's where uh, someone needs to make it right with someone else, right? So it can't be that you stand there or we stand there and defend our, interp our, our intention. Oh, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean it that way. That's not what I was trying to say, right? It has to be about my interpretation as a woman, as a black person, as a whatever. This is how it felt to me. And that's what we need to start hearing. We need to spend a little less time on intention and more time on interpretation. So I want to just borrow that from Kenny because I, it has served me in my walk of life as well. And it speaks to what this gentleman is, is saying. So uh, I'm down here now. <laughs> um, yes. yeah. okay. Hello, my name is Linda Shea Johnson. I'm a Master of Arts Management student at Columbia, graduating in May as well. So get your master's. Um, I had a question similar to the question that you asked. So I'll just preface, answer that question and then ask my question. Um, I love what, how you talked about inclusion, but also belonging. I am a black woman, but also an international student, so that's a whole other layer. Um, and there has been a lot of moments, even 
literally before I came here, I went to the luncheon, saw some of the scholarships and stuff, and some of the incredible high school, high school students that are here. But I came to America because I'm from the Bahamas, and we don't have theater there. Um, and so to do what I love, I had to leave home. And so that's one of like my major trajectories in life, and that's my North Star, to build our national theater. Um, but my question was for getting your, sorry, I had to write it down. ADHD. Okay, my question was about, yeah, your past and you come from that, you said in the, at that time you didn't know it was poverty and now where you are today. Um, what advice would you have for someone who comes from that as well and wants to be similar to where you are today? What advice would you have for pro propelling themselves forward after, in your story about the races, being set back in those places and not being able to start at the same finish line? Um, so what advice would you have for like being able to still come out um, on equal ground from everyone else, even though you started from behind? Yeah, thank you so much. This is, um, thank you. This is, um, this is a moment I get to honor my parents because whether I am trying to run a race in middle school or I am directing the Steve Jobs Theater at Apple, the core values that they gave me have served me. My dad knocked on our door every morning to go to school. You're showing up, you're going to school, you're going to school. There wasn't you take a day off. You had to be like, you took a temperature, you did the whole, like you had to really be sick. You couldn't say, I feel sick. You had to really be sick. Or you were going to school. So he taught us to show up. My mom, if we were, you know, not very nice to one of the brothers or sisters, she would make us apologize. And we treated each other in a way that I see other brothers and sisters not treating each other. But my mom demanded that in our household. She demanded that we stop and have the conversation with each other. Those are tools that have served me my entire life. The tool of believing in something bigger than myself. Um, and so, and, and a tool of you don't get to not finish. If you start it, you finish it. Whether or not you do it for the rest of your life is irrelevant. If you start this year in college, you finish this year in college. If you start the undergraduate experience, you finish the undergraduate experience. Do you have to do a master's? No. But if you start a master's, you finish a master's. So it was starting what we finished. And those tools, those fundamental core values, they have served me every area of life. We have a question, Brian. I think we have one more question. Hello, uh, my name is Miel Hurd Petra. I'm from Kentucky Wesleyan College. Firstly, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come here today. I guess <clears throat> I'd love to hear your thoughts about, <clears throat> sorry, uh, bending the bending the envelope and sort of pushing it forward in putting our people in positions where we're telling stories that weren't originally uh, told that way. I think one of the largest and most recent examples of that is like they cast, you know, uh, Hailey Berry to play The Little Mermaid. Why is that one of the biggest outrages in America, if you have any words on that situation? Yeah, I think we're still helping um, and America is still working with its consciousness, right? As, you know, to quote the John Henry Clark again, false images and, and people are still working through the, the false residuals of slavery. Um, America is still dealing with its consciousness. I think of this often as we think about the trauma that we experience as people of, of former enslaved Africans. We were not slaves, we were enslaved Africans, right? What does it mean for us to carry the trauma as, as you know, the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren of those who were enslaved in America? But I've been thinking so much about what does it mean to have trauma to come from generations who did enslave? And so I think wherever you're sitting, whatever social space you're sitting in, there is so much work that we need to do. There is so much work that we have to do within all of our hearts and all of our minds to, with intention, be the change we want to see in the world. It really does begin with the individual. So that outcry represented work that people need to do if they can't see this beautiful artist represent this character. 
and that it becomes a racial conversation. That means, oh, we still have a lot of work to do. And ignoring it and not having the conversations does not fix it. The band-aids that we have put on America and its racial strife, it's not fixed it. You know, we've got to start ripping these band-aids off and go in and start doing some surgery. And it is going to be painful, and it is going to hurt, and there may not be anesthesia, right? And there's going to be a recovery period till we can get to a better place. But up until this point, when I look at the arc of history, that's that moral arc that's bending towards justice, it is full of so many band-aids that are covering wounds that are not healing. So I do think that something much more radical is going to be required, and I am so heartened to be in a room with people from all walks of life where we can have this kind of open and transparent conversation. I like to think that we're having difficult dialogues with dignity as a people and that we're fundamentally building a civilization, and it happens one tough conversation at a time. Dr. Edouard? Etwaru, um, I think what a great way to end this by by asking us all. Um, it's up to us to to actually be the change that we want to see. So um, with that, I want to thank you for this so amazing conversation. Thank you so much.